again from the album Spirits. That is the title track, courtesy of the late, great Gil Scott Heron, encouraging us to make sure that we are uplifting spiritual energy in the way that we are uh thinking about how we storytell, how we support uh, even some of these wonderful filmmakers that are involved in our community and that are bringing uh, our information to light through their creative vehicles. And so that, of course, is what we celebrate each and every week here during the 11 o'clock hour on Fridays at uh, during Real Black Radio. And Mike Dennis is in the house. Hey, Stephanie Renee. Hey, everybody watching on Facebook Live. Hey, Facebook Live. Uh, Yes. So we got a jam packed show. Mm-hmm. And I just want to jump into it, but I do want to plant some seeds in terms because we have like a theme yes, for we change. Do. We've we've had two weeks without guests, and now we've got two guests back to back, and there's a there's a consistency here. Okay. So, um, well, first off, I mean, we're, as James Baldwin says, uh, we, you know, he said he's he's a writer in revolutionary times, and now we have artists, filmmakers, yeah. musicians that are reacting, re, you know, to what's going on today. Absolutely. And there's a lot of relevant work coming out. Uh, specifically today, we have, we're going to have two guests who have work that is premiering on Netflix in the next two weeks. Yes. And uh, and I was going to say, and our first guest, I got the Netflix email mm. that was featuring his film, which I think is really, really exciting because it's not often that I get those singular kinds of emails yeah. that have uh, black films and black filmmakers that are highlighted thusly. So no, I'm this excited is, about This that. is kind of a big deal, yes. you know, for folks paying attention. And this and uh, Yancey, I really appreciate uh, Yancey for being on the line with us today because I know he's got a super busy day. The movie premiered this morning on Netflix, Mm -hmm. so people can go see Strong Island on Netflix right now. But it's also opening in New York and L.A. this very same day for a week long engagement. You know what that means? Yes. Qualifies it for the Oscars. So this movie has already won Sundance and 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 he's going to be doing a Q and A at the IFC Center tonight. Mm-hmm. If you're in New York, go please support this movie. It's a very important film. And uh, with us on the line, Yancey Ford. Yes. Welcome to the program, Yancey. We're glad that you made some time for us today. Of course, Renee and Michael. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Yes. Well, congratulations. I mean, we met almost exactly a year ago at a Mixer uh, pre-Sundance. And, and right. uh, I know this is, uh, you know, I, I know it's a very difficult film to talk about. So I would I'd rather prefer you to take the lead and share what you want to about the film. I just want everybody to go see it and support it. Sure. Well, I, you know, it's funny, um, Renee, because I got the email about my own movie this morning as well. <laughs> Yay! So, so it was it was a real Twilight Zone moment for me to, to see uh, to see my face in my inbox from Netflix. Uh, but the film Strong Island is live right now. Um, you can queue it up and watch it. Um, it's it is safe for work. Um, and essentially, Strong Island is, is, is this. My my brother was murdered in 1992 by a white mechanic who claimed to have killed him in self-defense. And the film looks at two things. The film looks at the, the consequence of his, of his death on my family um, and the way that it played out over time. Uh, and it also looks at the, at the specter of race um, and the way that it hovered over the entire investigation, specifically when it came to um, the self-defense claim of this mechanic, mm-hmm. um, which was based frankly, on an incident that had happened three and a half weeks before um, he shot and killed William. So um, there's so much resonance, um, you know, in my brother's story that happened in 1992 um, to the cases that we see happening today, even though um, William was shot and killed by a civilian. The same narrative of hyper um, you know, hyperphysicality, hypermasculinity, inherent danger. Um, you could swap out names um, and dates, um, and it would read, it, you know, almost to the letter um, about uh, the killings of, of, you know, young uh, black uh, men and women, um, whether it's Renisha McBride being shot through um, someone's front door yeah. um, or Michael Brown, um, you know, being shot in the streets of Ferguson. Um, there, there's so little about the narrative of dangerous black people that has changed. Um, and, and that's really the focus of Strong Island. 
I got to ask you, you know, like I said, we want people to watch the film and they'll be able to get all of the details surrounding your brother's case by yep. participating in, in the viewing. But I'm curious about how you practice self-care and how your family uh, practices self-care, because I know that this story is about how you all dealt with um, you, your brother's uh, murder. And there's got to be a triggering or there's got to perhaps be some level of re-traumatizing that happens every time another one of these stories comes up in the news where you where you hear all this information being said about black folks who's uh, who are losing their lives at the end of somebody else's gun because of these perceptions sure you know i'm i'm really fortunate um to um you know have never in in my family um, or in my community have experienced, you know, a stigma around mental health care. Mm. Um, and I have a, a fantastic therapist um, uh, who I've you know, been working with for a long time. And frankly, it is re-traumatizing. Um, but I think even for people who've lived through this kind of death um, in their family, I think that what we, what we underestimate is the, is the initial trauma of seeing people losing their lives on the internet as if it were another form of entertainment. Yes, sir. You know, what, what we are watching time after time after time is the murder of a human being. And to see the, the life leave Eric Garner's body, to, to see Michael Brown lying in the hot, you know, streets of Ferguson, um, you know, to see Philando Castile slumped um, in the middle of his of his car with his child in the back seat and his girlfriend in the front seat with the presence of mind to live stream onto Facebook so that there would be a counter narrative. Um, you know, the, the, the entire community, um, the entire black community and those um, people of color who also find themselves um, at the hands or at the mercy of, of, of violence, whether it's per- perpetrated by the state or by civilians, um, you know, there is a there is a level of care that you and and being, um, you know, I I almost say gentle with yourself mm-hmm. in times like this. Uh, I think that it's important not to be triggered by by people like forty five um, <laughs> and and all of all of the dangerous rhetoric that I actually think is meant as a distraction. From the very from the very damaging policies that are being enacted to hurt our communities and to undo um, criminal justice reform, um, I, I think that it's important also to focus on how we can take care of each other, um, and that's where the notion of family and love as a family, but also extended family, yeah. um, chosen family, which you know is writ large, um, you know our community as a whole. Yeah, no, I mean very powerful film. I was at the premiere actually in in. Utah, Mm -hmm. you know, Danny Glover was there. I mean, he's one of the executive producers on the film. I mean, this film, you know, it starts 25 years this year since your brother's murder and 10 years making this film, you know, so I applaud you. And and the one thing that I shared on Instagram today was I, I, I meet so many people all the time that, that have stories like this in their family Mm -hmm. and they they come to me can you make a film about this can you testify and and you you do this i just wish everybody had the the resources and means and the talent to be able to share these stories but i i know one thing we talked about before sundance was that when you share like i knew you had some anxiety but when you shared the movie what has been the reaction have you have you encountered similar stories is this a catharsis you know, I have actually, I feel, I feel really grateful to have made this film because even as recently as last night, um, what happens at every screening is that Strong Island, you know, is almost, it gives permission for people who are in the audience who've survived traumas like this to stand up and say, or to come to me after the film and say, I lost my brother, or I lost my cousin, or I lost my sister. The number of people who have survived homicide at each screening is staggering. Yeah. It is staggering. And it really says to me that, you know, while I'm fortunate enough to be able to turn my brother's story into a film, we need to, you know, empower our community as a whole to talk about these deaths. Because the, the, you know, the trauma and the wounds and the injustice, it, it changes over time, but it never goes away. 
Um, and I have been really humbled by, by people who have been brave enough um, to come up to me after, um, you know, after the screenings and to say thank you. Because what I really want to say is, is thank you to them, um, you know, for having the courage to speak their truth and to speak their truth first time, um, you know, as a result of seeing Strong Island. And, you know, even the gentleman who, who drove me home, you know, last night, and, uh, you know, I got to tell you, I'm, I, you know, Netflix has been great in, in terms of putting me in, in a car to get, you know, to get me from one place to another, but I know that the time of cars will end. <laughs> but, um, you know, but, but the brother who drove me last night, he even lost his, he lost his little brother. <sighs> yeah. You know, and, and so it is, it is, it is remarkable how often I talk to people um, who have suffered this kind of loss. And it is also remarkable how many times the people who take the lives of their loved ones go unpunished. Right. This is an epidemic that has always afflicted our community. It's something that in the film, you know, is, you know, goes back to my great grandfather in 1944. And, you know, it may happen tomorrow. It may happen tonight. We don't know. Um, but, you know, it's it's been a really it's been a privilege, frankly, to talk to as many people as I have. And now that the film is live on Netflix, you know, I I, I can only imagine, um, and I'm so glad that there will be people all over this country who can see the film. All over the world, all over the planet. All over, all over. You know, it's it's a little intimidating to see <laughs> the number of people. You know, um, uh, it is it is it is a global release. And, and the amazing thing about it is that when I'm outside the country, there are just as many cases like my brothers and others that we have been, you know, focusing on in, in the black media. Yeah. There are just as many cases outside of the United States as there are here. Oh, without question. I mean, but, but the truth is in every single frame of this movie. And, and that's, that's what resonates. I'm just like, I'm just imagining, you know, moments from the film myself. And it's very... I know it's it's got to be tough for you, you know, just to have to reiterate. But I'm I'm glad that uh, it's out there, and people can now see it for themselves on a platform like Netflix. Yeah, I was, you know, the the, the really important thing for me was that the film be as accessible to as many people as possible. Um, and as you know, and and watching the film for me it changes on a daily basis. Talking about the film for me changes on a daily basis. You know, today it's really easy because I'm excited. Um, to share my brother's story with the world. Tomorrow it might be different. Yeah. Um, you know, but but for me, the important thing is that Strong Island, you know, also speak to young people, which is why the film is named Strong Island. You know, it's a it's a hip hop term. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the foundational you know groups like Public Enemy, yep. um, Rakim from Eric B and Rakim, um, are from Long Island. You know. Um, JBC Force, which, you know, had a, a song called Strong Island, which is in the film. Um, so, you know, part of the part of the title is also meant to, you know, to talk to our young people and, and to, to, to let them know that this is also a story for and about them. Um, and I don't want, you know, um, the millennials or, or younger kids to, to think that this isn't for them because it, it is. It is. Oh, without question. Well, we're we're about to hit our break, but I did I did want to ask you. I got in, you know, like social media is crazy. I've, yeah. I and the next movie we're going to talk about also deals with this disconnect in terms of, like I, I think your film is brilliant because you create a sense of empathy that is purely human, you know, and and you're willing to put your your faults and all out there, and and we all feel it, you know. But I feel like a big gap in terms of like getting justice is the lack of empathy. I mean, what what can we do? To change it, as viewers of this film, sure. How can how can we get more justice? That how seems can we to be get more justice? I think that I think that the black community. I think it's two things. I think that white people who see this movie um, need to understand that Strong Island does not need your empathy. I do not need your sympathy. What what Strong Island and cases like Strong Island um, need is your privilege mm -hmm. put to work in service of reforming a very broken criminal justice system. For African Americans who have been talking about the injustices in which, you know, under which they live and the circumstances of their own oppression for generations, I hope that this film is another affirmation of that truth, but also a map for the way forward and the way that love can help to heal a family and keep a family together. But ultimately, if you have power and you see this film, you need to use it. And if you're not willing to use your power to help achieve reform, then like, then like I say at the beginning of the film, 
you can get up and go. Mm. And that is a great last word. Yes. <laughs> no, this is this. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, we deeply uh, appreciate the the idea of it. it Sharing documentaries is not easy, as I mentioned uh, in, in your introduction. So being able to tell your truth in the hope that it will uh, allow other people to work through their own and yes. to see the role that they have in making things better is such a profound gift. And that is what you provided for us through Strong Island. And I'm glad that Netflix is really uh, stepping forward with promoting it yeah. so that as you know, folks uh, pull up their weekend uh, viewing plans strong island will be included as a part of it i know i'm going to check it out uh this weekend and we certainly thank you for your time here on the air this morning to let everybody in our listening audience know more about the journey and about the story renee and michael thank you so much it's been such a great pleasure to be with you this morning yeah i know you got a busy day thank you so much and have a great night go if you're in new york go support the film at IFC Center if you're in Los I'll Angeles. 705, I'll be at the 705 screening for a Q&A afterwards. Right. It's also opening t- same time in Los Angeles at the Lemley yep. and uh, a- everywhere on the planet. Yes. That Hashtag so Strong I. Island. We want to see that trend. We want everybody to comment after they see it and support it and tell other people about it because it's very important that we, like you said, fix this broken Yeah, system. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that's filmmaker Yancey Ford, and that's spelled Y-A-N-C-E. Yes. Uh, so just, you know, in case you're looking it up, if you want to find out more information about the film, about the story before you watch it, then that is uh, the filmmaker's name. So you can look it up, Google it, and uh, make sure that you are encouraging viewing and conversation around the film. Let's keep that, uh, you know, all kinds of award buzz going uh, oh, as it stands for telling these true stories. Yeah, he's going to need a, a several suits this award <laughs> season. So you know, look at look out for Strong Island. And then when we come back from the break, another great documentary that we that Real Black has the privilege of uh, yes. talking about oh, uh, premiering <laughs> a week from Monday at, at the African American Museum. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes, that and much more when we continue with this week's edition of Real Black Radio, part of the mojo here on Word Radio, 96.1 FM, 900 AM. We'll be right back. From a collection called Honeycomb Music Presents Black History Music, that is house diva Dawn Tallman with a remake of the Negro spiritual Motherless Child. And, um, you know, shout out to Josh Milan, who uh, from the group Blaze, for you househeads in the listening audience, who uh, has really been using his production talent to give us a revised view of some of the messages and some of the music that we hold dear uh, in our lives. That was available as a free download. So he's, you know, he's still selling music. He's still voicing music, um, but he's also drawing more people into the cultural dialogue through uh, some of the pieces that he puts together. Yeah, lots of good music coming out in this day and age as well. I, I noticed that you made a big investment this week uh, with the Esperanza Spalding Oh, I made the investment weeks ago. The, oh, okay. the minute I heard it announced, people and you know those of you and I'm, I'm speaking to my Facebook Live camera right now. Those of you who know me know that there was no way that Esperanza Spalding was a going to record a live album and me not have it, but certainly one where she's inviting people into the creative mm-hmm. process while she's making the album that deserves my money. So she got it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I got the link the first day and then I didn't buy it. I was like $60 too much. And then they were gone, you know? So I was like, okay, I, that could have been like school money. <laughs> like I could have paid my way through, like I, if I had kids, I, I could pay their college tuition with the money that that, that uh, limited edition LP is gonna get. You could not pay college tuition with $50. Just go with me. This is a segue for our next guest. (laughs) Sonia Lohman is on the line with us. She's got an amazing new film, uh, which premieres also on Netflix uh, a week from, well, actually September 25th, which is uh, a week from Monday, called uh, Teach Us All. And Real Black has the honor and privilege of screening it at the African American Museum that same very night. Hey, Sonia, how are you doing? Okay. There we go. Wait, we're going to take two. Take two. Hey, there you go. (laughs) There you are. Okay. Hello. 
Thank you for having me on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, hey, welcome. I, I know it's early where you are, so I appreciate you. I'm calling. actually in Kansas right now. So Kansas. Not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say Kansas is what two hours behind. It's only an hour actually. Oh. I'm Central Time. Okay. What's going on in Kansas? I'm curious. Um. So I actually work for an educational nonprofit that produced the film, and um, it's headquartered in Kansas. It's kind of a long story, but that's where one of the student projects, um, really the cornerstone student project. Um, originated so we built a center here and a museum and um, we actually showed the film last night it was a little premiere in the town it's a small town so it was, it was really fun nice awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah you're about to catch that wave too this this Netflix thing uh, I think this 2017 is going to be recognized as a year that movies changed like legitimately in terms of the way people exhibit and see films mm -hmm. uh, there was a big thing a couple weeks ago on New York Times where Hollywood was starting to blame Netflix I mean sorry Rotten Tomatoes mm -hmm. for destroying the movie industry and it's like, well, no, you got to make better movies. You know, Strong Island got 100%. You know, Teach Us All is, is way up there. It's going to get the thumbs up when, when it logs in. So, you know, but again, again congratulations. Yes. Because now we, the whole world gets to see the, the fruits of your labor. Can you tell us about Teach Us All? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so Teach Us All is the documentary film, um, and it's also a social justice movement we're trying to build around educational inequality in the U.S. Um, and I set the project against the backdrop of the 1957 Little Rock school desegregation crisis. Um, and this is when the Little Rock Nine took their courageous stand for educational equality. Um, and we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of that um, on September 25th. And so the film's a bit of a retrospective 60 years later, how far have we come or not come with regard to educational equality? And um, we're experiencing uh, resegregation of our schools in America. Um, so we're actually starting, you know, regressing in many ways, and the inequalities are very, very acute in many, many of our schools across the nation. Um, so the film tries to, you know, really bring that history forward um, and demonstrate its continued relevance on the lives of young people today. Um, and also sort of try to spark a movement um, that we're building to activate more student leadership in the movement for educational equality as, as well as support teachers um, and engage communities around this this critical issue, civil rights issue of our time. I, I got to jump in as, as the child of a, a former elementary school uh, teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things, and my mom taught in Ward 8 in D.C., which is the poorest um, area of the city. So the uh, the challenges to providing quality education in that kind of environment were, um, you know, significant. Um, but but one of the things I wonder if you have kind of developed any conclusions around what you depict in the film is whether you think the largest deficiencies exist within the resources that are available in some of these schools or the curriculum itself. Because here in Philadelphia, I think we struggle with that. It, it's wanting to make sure that there's equitable funding in the schools for children to be able to achieve a, a, a decent education. But the idea of what they're actually being taught and, and whether or not they're gonna be able to apply it in ways that are gonna uplift their lives is equally stressful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that the um, there's no question that we need more investment in public education, absolutely across the board. Um, but often there is money, and it's just not being spent very effectively, and it's or it's not being spent equitably. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really a big challenge: is really the allocation of resources that are out there. Um, and one of the main resources, or you know, in our, in our minds, the most important in many ways resources teachers and the teachers who are you know often working in um, you know the more experienced teachers tend to be often in environments where there is a lot more external support for students so they'll be drawn to, to higher paying jobs in the suburbs um, where there's more parent, you know parental engagement or more m money for parents to hire tutors and support the kids in other ways and then you and then you often have you know, some of the newer teachers um, going to environments where they're not getting support, where they're not getting resources, um, you know, they're not getting the training they need. And so, so that's a, that's a really big problem that sort of structurally the way that, that we allocate the um, capacity or the, you know, the human capital of our teaching core yeah. um, is a major issue. 
and um, agreed that absolutely the um, the relevance of education and the curriculum. I think you know a, a huge problem is that as the way that we teach um, history, the way we teach students, and, and our sort of national narrative leaves out um, a large number of our youth, so they don't understand themselves, you know, in our history books and in our, in our curriculum. Right. So it's a developing curriculum that's more relevant and more um, culturally sensitive, you know, talking to teachers who are going to be working in challenging environments about really understanding um, the experiences of their students and the lives that they're leading. I think there's a very big disconnect often um, between, you know, where teachers are placed in the community. So for me, one of the, the, the biggest solutions um, is that community engagement. And, and the best success stories I've seen is because the schools are doing that very, very active outreach into the community and working with the parents and really trying to understand their lives of their students. And if there's if there's a disconnect, if they're not engaging with the families and their students are just showing up in the classroom and they don't get, you know, what the kids are going through at home, it's, it's never going to work. They're never going to be able to meet their needs effectively. Fantastic. We're talking with Sonia Lohman, who's the filmmaker behind Teach Us All, which uh, premieres September 25th all over on Netflix and Real Black is hosting a screening at the African American Museum at seven o'clock that night. And it's also going to premiere that same day in 10 other cities through Array, uh, which has a deal with, with Netflix. I mean, and also, you know, Ava DuVernay, the founder of Array, did 13th, mm -hmm. which did some big things. I mean, the whole world kind of went seismic the mm -hmm. day the 13th dropped. So I was so super excited to see that we were going to be responsible for releasing this film, you know, so, you know, I mean, how, how does, how does it feel? I mean, this, this thing being amplified so much through Array. I mean, they're unbelievable, of course. Um, it couldn't be a more ideal partnership in my mind, um, because as I mentioned, the film is really the basis or the spark for a, for the social justice movement, and that's always been, um, in my mind, the, the more important piece, the impact side and what we can take action on. Um, so the fact that they have this grassroots infrastructure around the country and all these incredible um, volunteers who spend so much um, time and energy to really get the messages of the film out is just um, an incredible you know, infrastructure to be able to, to release this film through. Um, and then I think it's, you know, a perfect complement, obviously, for the other films they do, and especially 13th, um, because the link between school segregation and mass incarceration is so um, intimate. And, and a lot of the things that we saw in 13th really, really start when kids show up in the classroom at the age of four or five, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have a lot of statistics about yeah. the school-to-prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. So I think... You know, we want to start solving some of those those big issues like mass incarceration and poverty and all this stuff. We really got to start in the schools because um, by the time the kids are in second, third grade, you know, they're already building prison on those statistics on whether kids are reading on grade level. So um, it's it's a it's a, I think it's a perfect complement. Teach us all and, and 13th and just having a Ray as a partner couldn't. Um, yeah, I feel unbelievably blessed. So. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, we at Real Black, we do believe that children are the future. Mm -hmm. And if you teach them well and let them lead the way. You know what, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but we do appreciate, I mean, you know, your film and the subject matter of your film emphasizes to each of us that activism happens in every space where we consciously create yeah. it. And being able to illustrate the inequity that exists now is incredibly important for other people to be motivated to perhaps get off their tuchuses and actually get engaged in a way that will continue the 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 conversation and to create the positive change that's necessary to benefit these kids. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you're not telling the story, then we're missing out on the things that we don't see with our own eyes. And I think that's, you, you were our eyes for us bringing this story and and we appreciate that oh thank you yeah i mean i think it's it's very important we're at a time where we really more than ever need to take responsibility for the collective and we have a system that's really um unfortunately kind of siloed us and and made us um sort of individualistic and and um and that's you know fine we all want what's best for our children but i think we're definitely at a time where we need more unity and collaboration and we need to um really be be taking responsibility for one another and, and all of the children in this country. So no, I love it. You did an amazing job. I look forward to meeting you in person next weekend at Urban World Film Festival. Oh, 
wonderful. You know, which is also Thank premiering the film, the East Coast premiere for that film. And, uh, you know, just uh, congrats, 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 congrats. Thank you so much for your support. I appreciate your kind words, and we'll, we'll see you soon. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Sonia Loman. Teach us all. Yes. And that, I mean, that in and of itself, just the title of the film says so much. Oh, no. They're, they're not coming to save us. You know, as, as Betsy DeVos. Well, you know, so well. so we need. So when when this movie comes out again, we're screening at the 25th at the African American Museum. If you're not able to come to that, it's on Netflix everywhere. But mm-hmm. this is not one of Netflix and chill movies. Neither right. is Strong Island. Right. Like you can't go to sleep, roll over and go to sleep after you see these movies. You have to just stay awake and process. And process yeah. at, at least hashtag if not physically go out and do some of the, the mentoring things that the, the movie suggests. But it's a really a call to action. Very well done film and very important thing for us to keep our eyes on. And something that I say all the time as it relates to public education is if you are childless like me, mm-hmm. um, you probably haven't physically set foot in some of these spaces and seen the challenges firsthand. I was a teaching artist, so I was able to go in and, you know, try and and work my magic in the ways that I was contracted to do. But I also got a chance to see the realities of these conditions that our children are trying to learn under and some of the disconnect, regrettably, that may exist between their primary instructors and the classes in real time. A lot of other people don't have that that immediate kind of uh, connection right. to what this is. So this film is important because it lets you see in the statistics oh, and, and in real time what what yes. what public education looks like in America. Yes, and public education is is a right. It's not it's not a privilege. You know, you, it shouldn't be treated like bottled water. Like you get su- supposedly better education that you pay for it. We're, we're all paying for it through our taxes and, and yes. we need to deal with that. And this movie, I mean, I, one thing when I was watching, oh, I know we're going to break. One thing when I was watching the movie, I just thought about how many people just tapped me on the shoulder, took me aside that were teachers that just saw, like just gave me a little extra push that maybe I didn't get at home yep. that helped focus me or keep me on the right track. Well, so. I, well I had a lot of push at home, but I will okay. say, but the well, your val- parents were teachers. But. Well, yeah, my mom was, yeah. but, but the value of having instructors and having an ecosystem right. that is telling you, you can do whatever you set your mind to is invaluable. And the people who actually are paid to and have the time to invest in you for what happens, mm-hmm. because I shout from the rooftops every chance I get about my guidance counselor, Jacqueline Lovingood, who was forever grabbing me in the hallway between classes and shoving an application in my hand, right. going, apply for this program, do this thing. It's going to make you right. a, a better human being. Could, could, but it could be just as simple as just take, going to Staples and buy, getting a gift card and giving it to a teacher. Right. Because many of them, most of them have to buy their own supplies. Yep. You know, so so it could be some something as simple as that. You know that that would make a big difference in terms of helping. I was going to say, which isn't simple at all, because having the resources is a big deal. Right, but I'm saying with within ourselves, we don't we can't all be Chance the Rapper and do like an award show, right, and, right, right. and give a million dollars or whatever. But we we do have the the ability to to do mentorship or even just like take a box of uh, of pencils or paper or whatever is needed that that the teachers are paying from out of their own pocket and just helping them out that way so absolutely well we got to take our final uh, break of today's segment and then come back and try and wrap all this up great interviews today mike thank you and we will uh you know continue this uh uh, conversation about xxx no we are not talking about that uh (laughs) about Art as activism. He's when an we activist. wrap up, <laughs> xxx tenacion. If you see art. me bopping him over the head in okay, the Facebook so Live, we, we feed, just you know it. why. We'll, we'll figure out else. <laughs> He'll explain it we'll, when we come we'll, back we'll talk about to conclude this week's Real Black Radio. Hang yeah. tight. A little Sly and the Family Stone for you with one of now this one my family owned on 45, mm-hmm. so I could go right to the song and listen to it, even though Sly's voice scared me. Yeah, that was one of the first records I bought. I bought uh, There's a Ride Going On at the uh, Mount Airy Day 
I was, I must have been three or four years old and they had a used copy. Mm-hmm. And my, somebody, I forget who I was with, my, my uncle or my aunt. Let's say it was my aunt because we went, we hung out last week at the museum. Uh, let me pick out records and I recognize that. But uh-huh. uh, And then it's one of my favorite albums, when, you know, Sly, Sly and Family Stone. Definitely music to be listened to now. And even like later, like the Heard You Miss Me While I'm Back and, and Fresh and Small Talk, those are even better in terms of like, not the anthems that were from the 60s, right. but in terms of like really self-knowledge and stuff. Yeah. Great stuff. But the, well, b- wait, before you jump forward. OK. Part of the reason why I played that is okay. because for those of you who've been hanging out with Real Black Radio since the beginning. Oh, it's, it's our, our anniversary. anniversary. Yeah. It's yeah, our anniversary. Three years on the air. Yeah, this this week. <laughs> yeah. yeah how, did, how did you get that? I You got that on. OK. It was on and my Facebook memory. And I didn't get any cake. And we didn't do anything. I know. I, I, I didn't Y'all get Y'all fronting. I, I wasn't here yesterday. What do I get? Do I get a shirt? What do I get? Anything? <laughs> As he's get, wearing his forward three, I did shirt, actually. Yes. This was kind of a good choice. But um, if there's cake, I want some. <laughs> yeah, we should have done something special. We let that whole thing go by. So well, you know. All right, well, but I just, just wanted fun. to let people know. Yes. Hopefully, this show's gotten better. Um, but. <laughs> The uh, you know the Sly and the Family Stone they did like an oral history thing like a making of Sly and the Family Stone records and stuff and mm-hmm. what's interesting that was the first one that he recorded basically on his own but he was like in a complete drug haze like yes. like complete cocaine Bobby mm-hmm. Womack coming in and out all kinds of people walking in and out and completely paranoid dogs all over the place and everything and one of the, one of the things the reason why it sounds so lo-fi is not necessarily because it was intended it's because he would invite different women through the studio to record vocals over the tape to the point where they wore the tape out. They kept, <laughs> like, as soon as the people left, they would erase that over is, the vocal. That, that is some <laughs> Negro stuff right there. That is Negro stuff. Like out of the stuff. Deuce, like Method Man and Deuce kind of <laughs> characterization. So it was That's a great over. story. Well, the the thing is, if you read Pam Greer's book, she says I sang on Sly and the Family Stones record. So, if you want to put two and two together, somewhere on that ride going on, you can hear Pam's whisper <laughs> in there. Just a little bit of trivia for those who stuck out the that hour. That is great. <laughs> That, I really love the great. music. It's got all the spirits of all the group beat. Well, I wouldn't, I would, not Pam Greer, but all the other like women coming through. <laughs> wait, wait, no, no, no. But Kayla J, I, see, you weren't, you weren't producing for me at the time that. Well, she was, blocked me, so yeah, see, forget about it. Oh, okay, okay. Forget yes. about it. <laughs> so there's long, there's long-standing history, social media history between. I read Mike the and book. Pam That's all I'm saying. Look, I look. She put it in the book. She didn't have to put that in the book. She put a lot of things in that book. And I read it. You still love, mad, Mike? No, I love Pam Greer. I, no, no I'm, I'm not. There's nothing to be mad about. It's all. It's documented. Like go. It's facts. Like I'm not making this up. Right, right. Unlike some of the, and also facts. Dick Gregory has a new book out. We're giving away two copies on the website. Check that out. Really good stuff. Reading between the lies. I don't know if he's got the Sly and the Family Stone story in here, but he's taken a hundred. Uh, moments from in history black black american history and done his take on it so like you you get his take on emmett till tiger woods ray charles the cosby show i mean any very interested to see what he said about tiger well sanitized so he's not trying to go libel although they probably they might come up with another version (laughs) now that that he's uncensored version yeah i'd like to hear the original tapes of him documenting <laughs> these stories because they're they're clearly sanitized but if you if you don't have a familiarity it's just one of those things like I, it's a really easy read but it's one of those things that you can give it as a gift and, and it just connects all the dots all this stuff that's that's happened in our history that it's left out of our history books but told in a way that that has a black perspective and, and somebody that lived it and was there for most of it so um, I love the book and, and the tribute is tomorrow I plan on being down there so nice so um, the Dolor- Dolores Hair Her- Huerta movie yes. is out in theaters at the Landmark Ritz 5 this weekend. Mayori is doing the Q&A with uh, Ms. Dolores. Shout out to the start of Hispanic Heritage Month. Yes. Yeah, so. And, and yeah, for people who are confused, Hispanic Heritage Month runs September 15th to October 15th. We don't operate on calendar years, you know. Okay. Well. Uh, folk, folk of color are, are never on time and don't work within now, I'll normal say this, this may offend somebody, but they're really early. You know, because like six, seven o'clock in the morning, they're there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you hire brothers to do it. Uh, that, It'd that, be like that's, noon that's for, that's before for, you get your grass That's for cut. the migrant worker thing. But in any 
Latin American country. It's I'm saying no, 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 no. I'm okay. not. Okay, see, I'm sorry. I don't know anything. Racist. No, I don't know anything. I'm you talking tell, about you're me. the a completely different sense of time. Mm. Like somebody can call you up and go, "I'm going to come pick you up so that we can do such and such in the morning," and they'll show up at three o'clock in the afternoon, and that's just the way things go. Well, maybe I got some Hispanic blood in me because that's that seems to be my wavelength <laughs> lately. Although I feel like I'm getting old, I'm waking up like four in the morning, wide awake, you know, and I'm just like, and I remember I'll my, just my say, grandma. Brazil, my, that ugh, I mean, most 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 it's Spanish just a different country is or like or at least you, Latin American countries that I've been to. That's how it operates. There's no real sense of of uh, you know, kind of U.S. time oh. that you say you're going to do something, and you know, not even well, Negro yeah, standard no, well, time with a half hour late it's just well even the eight, eight hour work day is overrated you know i love siesta like it's so hot in these places that they just take two hours off so mm-hmm. like, all right we're going home so i love it but they eat it's not just sleep there's eat there's drink there's just rest i love it siesta doesn't have to be a nap that's what i love i love it um mustafa asalane am i saying it right the yes. retrospective Al- alasane alasane nigerian Film pioneer, his his films are screening this weekend at International House, well, Lightbox Film Center, formerly International House. And I went last night. Very interesting work. And, and tonight, a lot of short films and features. Good stuff. And um, I believe Sarah Mueller is doing Pariah uh, on the Cinespeak. Oh. So I think that's this weekend. But, nice. Yeah, but I'll unfortunately I'll miss it because I'll, I'll be in D.C. Yeah. and I'll, I'll check out the black uh, owned coffee. Yes, Taharka Brothers for those of you who are on, in the Beltway area yeah. um, is a black owned um, ice cream. So if anybody wants to take me to ice cream to, on Sunday I'm down for, for uh, Baltimore. They have a new coffee flavor that's called Get Woke which I love. Okay. That's how you know it's black well, folk. Black-owned businesses, <laughs> definitely in things. So, I mean, well, we're, we're all out of time. So. Yes, sir. Yeah. But, hey, but plenty, plenty to do. But the main thing is don't, don't sleep after you watch these Netflix movies. At least do one, at least one thing. Yeah. Progressive that's going to help affect the change. You can't. And promote it. Make sure that your friends are not sleeping on these films, but, that they are checking them out and that they are discussing what the films are discussing in a substantive way. There's, there's certain things you can't unsee. Like, I can't unsee Soul Plane, and that's a negative. But seeing Strong Island, seeing Teach Us All, that's enlightened me to the nth degree. And now I'm a, I'm a different person. That and you will, you will too, when once you see it. Yes, and ignore any posts that you see Mike make about this stupid music video that we made brief reference to earlier. Don't do it to yourself. He's, he's had semi woke. I mean, as woke as Molly can. Boo! He has triple X in the front of his name. That's all most folks need to know. Well, he got attention. The KKK, people, the KKK is after him. You now. know me. You know me, and you know how me and him normally argue. Trust me when I tell you, you will not get that however many seconds you can last of your life back. Don't do it. XXX to Nacion. But, but yeah, he's part of the freshman class, double XL freshman class. He's one of the the next wave they of rappers. They have lost all credibility. And, yeah, he'll do anything for attention. But I, I think his lifespan is limited now because he's put this video out, a very dangerous video. So just like Kathy Griffin, I think he, he <laughs> may... He may Tell regret me. his choice Tell artistically. <laughs> and with that, we will end this week's edition of Real Black Radio. Hang tight, though. We got to talk about other ways for us to take good care of ourselves economically, which, of course, is incredibly important. In our third hour of today's mojo, we're going to be talking about the debt ceiling and we're going to be talking about job fairs. So how it's impacting you already. If you think you don't have any money, how it's stunting your growth, but also how you can get um, more gainful employed, how you can add to your income, how we can all rise above the nonsense and try and do better for ourselves and our community. That is how we'll continue today's TGIF edition of The Mojo in just a moment. Bye, Facebook Live.